Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Cycle 2015. Our last session for the day is Peter Jaworski, a philosophy professor and, unusually enough, an intelligible philosophy professor who does not put you to sleep. On this grounds alone, he was worth hearing, but he also has interesting things to say on topics we care about. So, Peter, take it away. Yeah, good. So we'll see if I'm uh, intelligible as we go through this. Um, okay, good. So the title of my talk is How Much for That Kidney in the Window? Uh, Markets Without Limits. <clears throat> and the title of the talk is actually in honor of uh, a book that I co-wrote with uh, Jason Brennan. It's here in the background if you can see it right there. It's called Markets Without Limits. Um, so without further ado, I mean the topic of today is going to be primarily about kidneys, but it has broader application too. So let's get to it. Um, People have been objecting to the buying and selling of certain things since time immemorial. I mean, even Adam Smith noticed that there are some things that people think are agreeable and fun to do, but then as soon as you do them for money, people seem to object. Now, in his case, uh, he thought it was a kind of public prostitution, and he included things like opera singing, dancing, and other things as examples of the sorts of things that people at his time thought were you know, fine to do for free, but gross to do for money. And I hope you can see this, by the way. I'm trying this iPad Pro, um, see if it works. There's an almost limitless market for books about the moral limits of markets. So just in the last few years, people like Margaret Jane Radin and Michael Sandel and Deborah Satz and Elizabeth Anderson, and over there at the end is Michael Walter, They've all re released books that argue that there are certain moral limits to markets, and in particular, they defend the following thesis. It's the repugnant markets uh, thesis or the kind of strong moral limits to markets thesis. It tells us that there are some things that are permissible for us to do, to have, to possess, to exchange for free, but not for money. Right? So there are some things that everyone seems to think is perfectly okay for us to give away uh, or to have, but as soon as money enters the equation or as soon as we exchange these things on a market, then suddenly those perfectly okay things turn into uh, immoral things. Like it becomes immoral for you to engage in those kinds of exchanges. So they Peter, are defending... Peter, sorry, let me jump in because your little iPad there is only partly on screen. If you want everybody to read that, if you could move a little bit closer... A little bit closer. Or, or move, yes, there you go. Okay, now we can see the whole thing. Very oh, good. Back great. to you. Because okay. I'm looking at my own screen, and it looks like it's in the, it's in the little bar. But. Okay, so um, the thesis that all those other people defend is this exact thesis. So as soon as money and markets enter the picture, then there are some things that become immoral that weren't immoral when they're done for free. Right. So we're looking for an asymmetry. Uh, cases where it's okay to do, have, or exchange something for free, but not for money. And as you'll see, kidneys are a prime example of this. We kind of think that it's laudable. In fact, we encourage people to donate their kidneys for free or to donate their blood, for example, for free. But we tend to think that as soon as people want to buy and sell kidneys, then suddenly it's immoral, right? So that's the other view. And then the thesis of my book, here it is, right, Markets Without Limits, is, um, is that if it's okay to do for free, then it's okay to do for money. Now here are two different types of objections to markets that people raise. First are in principle objections to markets. These are what we sometimes call symbolic or semiotic objections to markets. Here we focus on the nature of a market exchange and we say that there's something that clashes like kidneys on the one hand and money and markets on the other hand, they, they are in conflict and so we shouldn't have markets because of the meaning of that market exchange. So you can think of cases of people saying like, what does it mean for us to buy and sell kidneys? Don't we have the wrong attitudes when we think that it's permissible to buy and sell kidneys, etc.? Then there are in practice objections as well. And here the objections are something like, um, for example, the poor will become farms for the rich, so we're concerned about exploitation. Or we're worried that the poor won't have access to the good things in life. For example, kidneys, right? 
uh, or we might worry that markets and certain things will lead to wrongful inequality or impermissible inequality. I won't really talk about the in-practice objections to markets today. Instead, I'll focus on the in-principle objections, and I'll try to show you why those in-principle objections to markets fail. And then during the question and answer session, we can talk about any other objections you might have to markets, or if you want, um, we can talk about anything, frankly. OK, first, let's begin with uh, a good definition of a market and a market exchange. So a market exchange is a voluntary exchange of a good or service for consideration. Those are the three essential features of a market exchange. right? <clears throat> so as I said, market exchanges are quid pro quo, right? Like a this for that. Um, other examples like uh, gift exchanges, they're without that that um, quo, right? They're a, I give you this and I don't expect anything in return. And then communal sharing, it permits other people to make use of the thing, but you don't expect anything in return. And those are the three different types of exchanges that sociologists and others identify as the key kinds of exchanges. So when people object to markets, they're objecting to this thing at the top, the quid pro quo, but they oftentimes think that communal sharing or gift exchanges of those things are perfectly okay or permissible. So let me give you a few examples of market exchanges that meet the criterion. So here's one over here. We've got uh, money for fish. That's a market. We've got a gift card for fish. That too is a market. And then finally here's an example of someone bartering for something. Here's a bunch of grain and you get a fish and that too counts as a market exchange. All three of those things are examples of market exchanges. Now consider what doesn't get to count as a market exchange. So your money or your life is a perfect example of something that is not a market exchange. Or, for example, here's a gift. You don't owe me anything in return. Obviously, that's not a market exchange either. And then finally, here in the bottom corner, you've got a here's some ice cream that I have. Uh, would you like to share it with me? That, too, is not an example of market exchange, right? So here's an overview of what I'll cover. First, I'll talk about the independently wrong, which is the kind of objection that I get right away that I want to deal with and get off the table. Then I want to talk a little bit about why this particular debate matters. And I'm talking about specifically a market in kidneys. Uh, then I'll go through um, two different kinds of in-principle objections to markets, the mere commodity objection as well as the wrong signal objection. So when I talk about markets without limits, inevitably someone asks me about slavery. Right? They say, well, here's, here's an example of a limit on markets. It's an obvious limit on markets. Slavery, right? If you're talking about markets without limits, then surely you're talking about this thing too. Neither Jason Brennan nor myself think that a market in slaves is perfectly permissible. In fact, we think it's impermissible. But our point is that it's not the market that makes slavery wrong. Slavery is independently wrong of markets. The wrong of slavery is captured by the removal of the autonomy of another human being, an autonomy that that human being is entitled to. So you can just think of a gift exchange of slaves that would be wrongful as well. right? So it's not the market that causes or contributes to the wrong of slavery. And for that reason, because it's independently wrong, we don't, we don't think it has anything essential to do with markets. Similarly, here's Ezio from Assassin's Creed. I don't know enough about Assassin's Creed, unfortunately, or else I'd talk a little bit more about it. But here's murder for hire, right? Here's another example uh, of a, what most people think is a legitimate limit on markets, and both Jason Brennan and myself agree that is a legitimate limit on markets. You can't have murder for hire, but just as in the case of slavery, it's not the market that makes this wrong. It's not the market that causes or contributes to, to the wrong of assassinations for hire. Instead, if you were like, I will make a gift of an assassination for free to my best friend, that would similarly be wrongful. And so it has nothing to do with markets, right? Let me illustrate why 
this move that we're making in the book makes a lot of sense. So, for example, suppose that you wanted to write a book about the moral limits of wearing a hat. And suppose that the content of your book was as follows. So first you establish the independent premise that it's immoral to lie, and then you say why it's immoral to lie and wear a hat. You go on to establish the independent premise that it's immoral to cheat, and you say, look, it's, if it's immoral to cheat, then it's immoral to cheat and wear a hat. Similarly, if it's immoral to steal, then it's immoral to steal and wear a hat. But notice that this is entirely trivial. Hats have nothing to do with the wrongness of lying, cheating, and stealing. If you were to write a book like that, all of us would think that you're cheating in some way, and you would be cheating in some way. So what we are asking for from the people who write books about the moral limits of markets is that they address themselves to those cases where they think markets cause or contribute to the wrongness of the exchange, right? So this is trivial and it doesn't work. So if it's independently wrong, this is the bottom line, then markets, as I've said, do nothing to help us understand the wrongness of those exchanges. So it's not like murder for hire. It's not the for hire part that is wrongful. Slaves for sale, it's not the for sale part that's doing the moral work. It's the slavery part, similarly with murder for hire, right? Um, so if it's inherently wrong, then again, markets add nothing to our understanding of the wrongness, um, and that's irrelevant. Now let's shift gears a little bit and talk about why this matters. So here I have a clock, and it's set to 10 minutes. Well, it turns out that every 10 minutes, there's a new person in the U.S. added to the waiting list for organs. So every 10 minutes, Another, another person in the U.S. is in need of an organ. Right. Here's, here are the numbers. These are the patients who are waiting specifically for kidneys. So you'll see that over time there has been an increase in the number of people who are on a waiting list waiting for kidneys. And down here in red, you have the number of kidney operations that are performed every year. So these are the number of transplants that occur every year. Now notice that the gap is widening. A part of the reason why the gap is widening is because kidney dialysis machines have become a lot better than in the past, and so patients are surviving longer. But kidney dialysis is, I mean, frankly, it's, um, it's torture. Being on a kidney dialysis machine is terrible. You have to go there, you get set up, you get, right, you sit there for a long time, it's terrible. So the numbers are increasing. There's over 100,000 people on the waiting list for a kidney in the U.S. alone. Here's another chart that I have, perhaps. Yes, okay. So here's the number of kidney transplant operations as a percentage of the patients on the waiting list, right? So I showed you before that that gap was widening between the number of people who are on the waiting list and the number of transplants that are performed. Here's another way of visualizing that same data. You'll notice that the percentage of transplants as a, as a total percentage of the number of people on the waiting list is declining. And it turns out that kidneys are, in fact, the organ that people need the most. It constitutes over 90% of the need for organs is kidneys. Here you have 96,000 of the over 100,000 people waiting on a waiting list for an organ. 96,000 of those people are waiting for a kidney. You have other things, too, like a liver. Some are waiting for heart, some are waiting for lungs, but liver and kidney make up the majority. You can also donate a portion of your liver and survive the procedure, so you can do that as well. Every 15 minutes, um, excuse me, every 10 minutes a new person is added to the waiting list, but every 18 minutes somebody dies on the waiting list waiting for a kidney. Right. So here are the number of people who are removed each year from the waiting list, either because they are uh, too sick to transplant, 
the organs, so they become, they've been on dialysis for too long, and they've been so sick and they become so sick that we can no longer transplant kidneys into that person. And then in the blue, you see the number of people who leave the waiting list because they've died waiting for a kidney. So you can see that there's over 6,000 people who die every year in the U.S. waiting for a kidney. Now we've tried all manner of things. I have an example here from the early 90s. Michael Jordan was part of a campaign where they tried to get people to voluntarily donate their kidneys to become living donors. Um, we also try every year to get people to sign their organ donor card. And I would encourage you to do either or both of those things. If you haven't signed your do organ donor card, if you happen to be in the U.S., you really should. Um, but we've tried this, and nevertheless, it hasn't really helped. Um, it hardly moves the needle at all, right? Even if we have celebrities like Michael Jordan representing the, the goal of, of getting people to donate their kidneys, right? And here's um, the organ donors per million in different countries. So you'll notice that the number of people who are donating kidneys is very small, right? And you see this, so the number of living donors, so in Spain, for example, you see that tiny little blue bar there, that's the number of people who are giving a kidney uh, who are alive. Like the total number here is about 38, right? And of those, a tiny fraction, like six per million or something like that, are willing to, to give their kidney while they're alive. The remainder is from people who are deceased. But if you look at these numbers, they're so small per million population. There's no way that they could, that they could fix the entire problem. Right? So even if we take all of these, you know, even if we increase the number of people willing to give their kidneys um, after death, that's not going to fix the problem. And true, we could fix the problem if more people were willing to give their kidneys while they were alive for free, but people are not so willing, even though you'll notice the United States is, I think, uh, on this chart, uh, the most charitable per million when it comes to, to giving up a kidney. And then people do all kinds of things in order to try to get a kidney as well. So here's uh, a few images of people setting up billboards. So here's one that just says, I need a kidney with a phone number, right? And people talk about how, um, you know, a market in kidneys might be uncivilized or it might be disrespectful, but consider what people have to go through in order to put up a billboard like this, right? Like here's Here's a specific person, help save my husband's life. Um, so this person needed a kidney, they purchased this billboard. So they spent money to put a billboard up to encourage people to give their kidneys, in this case to her husband, but we don't allow people to give money to encourage, to incentivize someone to donate their kidney directly, right? And here's a third billboard, um, young mother needs live kidney donor, is it you? Um, Sometimes people take these walking billboards and they walk around cities and they, they have, like, I need a kidney donor in this case. And they'll walk around the city hoping that somebody will be willing to donate uh, a kidney, right? So people get pretty desperate trying to get a kidney for their loved ones for, for themselves. Now, I've said that increasing the number of people who sign their organ donor cards isn't going to fix the problem, and it's not. Getting celebrities to encourage us to donate our kidneys, that's not going to do it either. But we do have a possible solution. We know what would work. What would work is a market in kidneys. And the reason why we know that it would work is because there is one place in the world that allows a market in kidneys. That place is, um, to everyone's surprise, I guess, Iran. In Iran, it's legal to buy and sell kidneys, and in Iran, there isn't a waiting list of people waiting for a kidney. Instead, there's a waiting list of people who want to sell their kidneys, right? Now, Iran's system isn't perfect, and while I support, to some extent, their method of uh, procuring organs, 
um, there are some difficulties with the Iranian system. But nevertheless, people don't die in Iran for want of a kidney, and that's important. And some of the difficulties with Iran's system can be overcome in the US, in Canada, in Australia, and elsewhere, precisely because we have better legal and political institutions, right? Okay, so we know that it would work. We know that a market in kidneys would work, so why haven't we done anything about it? Why haven't we instituted a market in kidneys, right? And it turns out, as Alvin Roth, Nobel Prize winner in economics, as he points out, repugnance is a real constraint on markets, right? It's as real as other kinds of constraints on markets. People, when they think about a market in kidneys, they're disgusted, they raise a number of different objections, and you know the way I put it is they're willing to allow over 6,000 people in the US to die every year in order to avoid feeling disgusted. Right? I mean, I think that's, I think that's a fair way of putting it. Uh, the numbers are 256 in Canada, 256 people um, die per year waiting for a kidney and we're disgusted, repulsed, and so we don't want a market in kidneys and that's part of the reason why um, people don't have a market in kidneys despite the fact that it would work. In 1984 when the National Organ Transplant Act was passed in the United States, Al Gore was a senator then and during the debate he said that markets in kidneys would make the poor a source of spare parts for the rich and that was his reason for not having a market in kidneys. right? So here's the repugnant markets objection, okay? Um, there are some things that are permissible to have, use, and exchange for free, but not for money. So that's the thesis on the other side. Now let me get into some concrete arguments that they've raised and tell you why I think that they don't work. So here's Elizabeth Anderson's objection to uh, certain kinds of markets. Now she's talking about this in the context of commercial surrogacy, but it applies to kidneys just as well, right? So she says, uh, kidneys are not a mere commodity. To buy or sell a kidney necessarily means you regard kidneys as a mere commodity. It is wrong to regard kidneys as a mere commodity, and so it follows that it is wrong to buy or sell kidneys. Call this the mere commodity objection. So they, they think that there's a necessary connection between the act of buying and selling something and having certain kinds of attitudes towards the thing that you're buying and selling, right? Uh, like I said, in 1984, the debate over the National Organ Transplant Act included this quote from the committee. It is the sense of the Senate Labor and Human Resources Committee that individuals or organizations should not profit by the sale of human organs for transplantation, right? And they said, the committee believes that, the human, that human body parts should not be viewed as commodities. And notice that in this debate, they also thought that there was some kind of necessary connection between buying and selling something and thinking of that thing as a mere commodity. And, you know, closer to my philosophical home, Michael Sandel says something similar, too. He says that markets don't only allocate goods. That's not the only thing that markets do. They also express certain attitudes towards the things, um, towards the goods being exchanged, right? So there's, there's some kind of attitude that we necessarily have when we buy or sell something, and that attitude is the thought that the object that we're buying is a mere commodity, right? Now, what does it mean to think of something as a mere commodity? Uh, philosophers give three sort of descriptions or criteria for thinking of something as a mere commodity. So, first, we deny the subjectivity of the object that is bought or sold, right? So, either the commodified thing lacks consciousness, or is something whose experience and feelings need not be taken into account. So when we think of something as a commodity, the first thing we do is we deny the subjectivity of that thing. And of course that's perfectly fine when it comes to pants or rocks, and the reason why is because neither pants nor rocks have a subjectivity. And so for these philosophers it's perfectly okay to think of rocks and pants as commodities. It's perfectly appropriate because they don't have an inside 
Um, they don't have a perspective on the world. They don't have a subjectivity. Right? Secondly, instrumentality. The commodified thing has only or mainly instrumental value. So that means that the commodified thing has no intrinsic value. And of course, again, it's perfectly appropriate to think of rocks and pants as having only instrumental value. The reason why I want a pair of pants is maybe to keep me warm, right? It's useful as a tool. Keep me warm, keep me from being naked, I guess, in public or something like that as well, right? But it would be wrongful, you might think, to think of your own kidney as having merely instrumental value. At least some people think that the human body is sacred or special in this almost religious way. And so if you were to think of your kidney as a mere instrument, if you were to think of your kidney like you do a pair of pants or like you do a pair of shoes or something like that, then people might think that that's the wrong attitude to have, right? And then finally, fungibility is the third criterion. The commodified thing is replaceable with money or other objects. In fact, possessing this object is the same as possessing money. So the third key component of thinking of something as a commodity is that it's just totally fungible with money. So sometimes you might even think of the object in terms of its cash value. And these people are going to think that that's, again, perfectly okay when it comes to certain things like pants and rocks, but it's going to be problematic or at least, um, um, you know, it's going to be the wrong attitude when it comes to certain other things um, like, like kidneys, but I might as well, you know, like sex too, right? Sex is another example of something that we, that many people think is perfectly appropriate and okay for people to give away for free, but as soon as you sell it, well, that demonstrates that you have a mere commodity attitude towards your sexuality, and so you might think for these reasons that it's wrongful, right? And so here's Elizabeth Anderson. Here's a long quote. Let me read the long quote. I don't know if you can read it yourself, so I'll read it to you. Elizabeth Anderson says, to say that something is properly regarded as a commodity is to claim that the norms of the market are appropriate for regulating its production, exchange, and enjoyment. To the extent that moral principles or ethical ideals preclude the application of market norms to a good, we may say that the good is not a proper commodity, right? Okay, now let's address some of these objections, right? Oh, wait, let me summarize first the view that I've just presented, right? So the norms of the market or market norms, they structure and they shape our attitudes. Uh, markets, according to these people, cause us to be more self-interested, to engage in more crass calculation, to regard uh, uh, stuff for sale as, a, as having nearly instrumental value for the satisfaction of our non-moral desires, right? So in short, you might call this thesis the market's cause homo economicus thesis. Homo economicus is the sociopathic individual who cares only about him or herself and uh, thinks of everything in the world as having merely instrumental value, right? So I guess here's part of my response anyways. Uh, I can ask you out there, like, how many of you have one of these? It's a puppy or a dog, right? Think about a puppy or a dog or, or consider the number of people who have cats. I have two cats, for example, right? And think about the number of people who have this kind of attitude towards their cats and towards their dogs. Um, many of us think of cats and dogs as not just fungible commodities, we think of them as members of our family. When I give this talk uh, at different places, I ask people, you know, whether or not, you know, how much they paid for their cat and their dog. And it turns out that sometimes people pay a lot for their cat or their dog, like a thousand dollars. And then I ask them if they've ever taken their cat or dog to a vet. And they say, yes, have they ever spent more than $1,000 on fixing whatever medical condition or problem their cat or dog has? And oftentimes people say, yes, they've spent more than $1,000. And then I ask, you know, have you ever thought of replacing your, you know, your, 
your defective dog with a brand new one, especially since you can get an adorable puppy for less than a thousand dollars, right? And most people say, no, I've never thought about that. In fact, people say that it's offensive to even think that. Now notice that these people have purchased their cats or their dogs. Not true, some people get them uh, at a shelter. But the people who buy their dogs and buy their cats, many of them do have the right attitude towards their cats and dogs. They think of them like members of their family. And so obviously if this is possible, then there is no necessary connection between buying and selling something on a market and having the mere commodity attitude towards the thing that you've bought and sold. Now cats and dogs are one sort of example, right? And they illustrate that in fact there are at least two different senses of commodity. In one sense, a commodity is just anything you buy and sell on a market. But the commodification attitude, which is the other sense, is the attitude that we take where we deny the subjectivity, um, where we deny, uh, where we attach merely instrumental value to the thing that we buy and sell, and where we regard as totally fungible with money the object that we've purchased. People don't have that attitude towards cats and dogs, and so it's possible to split these two things. It's possible for someone to buy something on a market and have not this attitude, but a very different attitude towards that object or thing, right? So the bottom line is exactly that. There is no necessary connection between buying and selling anything and having a commodification attitude towards that thing. During the question period, I can tell you a little bit about Alfred Barnes, who's, who was an art collector in Pennsylvania, and there's plenty of people who collect art and who have the right attitudes towards art, despite the fact that they buy and they sell art, right? Now here's the wrong signal objection. Um, so you might think that like buying and selling something doesn't tell us anything about the attitude that you have towards the things that you've bought or sold, right? But nevertheless, you might think that like in buying something, you're sending a signal to somebody else. You're, you're signaling that you have a certain attitude, even if you don't actually have that attitude. So let me spell out that kind of objection here. It's the wrong signal objection. Buying and selling certain objects tends to express morally deplorable attitudes, even if you don't have those attitudes, right? So, um, well, I'll illustrate later. This expression occurs independently of any attitudes that the person may happen to have. If so, then commodifying certain objects is wrong. Therefore, commodifying certain objects is wrong. So sometimes it would be wrongful to send a certain message. Now, let me tell you the story of King Darius of Persia. He said, um, my people respect their fathers. That's what King Darius said. He said, we all want to publicly signal our respect. But the Greeks do something very different from the Colossians, and so King Darius thought to himself, I will get the Greeks and the Colossians here, and I'll ask them about their funereal practices, their funeral practices, right? And so he brought in the Greeks, and he said, Greeks, you respect your fathers? And the Greeks were like, why, yes, King Darius, of course we respect our fathers. And he said, well, tell me, how do you demonstrate that respect at a funeral, right? And the Greeks sort of scratch their heads, and they're like, well, it's kind of plainly obvious. Like, what do we do at a funeral? Like, isn't it like King Darius, we burn our fathers on a funeral pyre, right? Um, doesn't everybody burn their father on a funeral pyre, said the Greeks? Because, frankly, burning your father on a funeral pyre, that signals respect for the dead. Like, just consider, like, for a moment, like, just let's pause for a second and think on the one hand, like, here's fire, right? So here's fire. Now picture fire in my hand, okay? And now on, on the other, over here, picture, picture your deceased father. And now take your father and put him on the funeral pyre. And what is immediately the thing that you think? Respect, right? That's clearly, obviously, duh, the thing you would think, right? And King Darius pressed on and he said, hey, listen, Greeks, would you ever eat your fathers, your deceased fathers? And the Greeks were outraged. The Greeks were shocked that he would even ask such a question. He said, King Darius, 
That idea is disgusting to us. It repulses us. Do you know what else we eat? We eat like celery and beetroot and, and just food. If we were to eat our dead fathers, why, that, would, that would be to treat our dead fathers like mere food. It would be to disrespect the meaning of a funeral, right? It would be completely outrageous. We would never do such a thing. And King Darius said, okay, that's fine. He brought in the Galatians, and he said, Galatians, you respect your fathers. And the Galatians were like, well, of course, King Darius, of course we respect our fathers. Who doesn't respect their fathers? We respect our fathers. And King Darius said, well, tell me, how do you demonstrate that respect at a funeral? And the, the Galatians, just like the Greeks, kind of scratched their heads a little bit. They were kind of confounded by the question. And they said, well, King Darius, why we eat the hearts of our fathers, duh, right? Like, doesn't... Doesn't everybody? Like when you think about somebody passing away and you think about how to demonstrate that you respect them, isn't it obvious that you would think to like uh, eat their hearts? That just seems obvious to us. So of course we would eat the hearts of our fathers. And King Darius pressed on and he said, well, listen, Galatians, would you ever burn your dead father on a funeral pyre? And the Galatians, just like the Greeks, were completely horrified and outraged. And they said, King Darius, that idea is disgusting to us. It is morally repulsive to even think about burning our fathers on a funeral pyre. Do you know what else we burn? Well, we burn our garbage. If we were to burn our dead fathers, that would be to treat our dead fathers like we would mere garbage. It would disrespect the meaning of funerals, right? And the point of this story about King Darius is that the meaning of market transactions, just like the meaning of funeral practices, that those are contingent facts. Those meanings are not woven into the fabric of the universe. They're contingent. They're conventional, right? So we could start a convention like you and I ourselves, right? Like if I were to... I know that th this has a global audience, so some of you may not understand the meaning of this, but uh, if I may be so bold, right, if I were to go like this, right, that would be disrespectful, right? But the reason why it would be disrespectful is because this means, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to mention this word, I'm not going to use it, so if you want to look up the distinction between use and mention it's going to be important. This means fuck you. It means fuck you in Canada, in the US, and in Australia. That's what this means. But notice that you and I could adopt a different convention. We could agree amongst one another to make this mean like thank you and I respect you, right? And we can agree to that. And then when you and I show each other this, why that's perfectly respectful. And notice that like different countries and different parts of the world use different kinds of hand gestures to indicate, and again, I'm just I'm mentioning it, not using it to indicate fuck you, to, to indicate disrespect. So in some countries it's like this, you know, another country. And when you look at your hand, right, it's not obvious like that this can't be a sign of disrespect. So the point here is that it's not woven into the fabric of the universe, the meaning of symbols like this or like this, it's just a convention like the funeral practices here, right? So that's the bottom line here. And I have a, a final kind of uh, a example to highlight my response to these kinds of objections. I have here a cartoon, and Michael Sandel, and I have his book here. Here's his book, right? Michael Sandel tells us lots of different stories about people using money in context where some of us are pretty offended about it. So this cartoon demonstrates like one couple is handing cash to another couple and the, the, the little byline at the bottom says, we didn't have time to pick up a bottle of wine, but this is what we would have spent. Right? So ha ha ha, um, it would be wrongful if you were to walk into a party and just hand the host like a bunch of money and say, I, you know, here's the money that I would have spent on wine, right? And Michael Sandel, he mentions a number of these cases. So you can imagine going uh, to dinner at a friend's house. Uh, your friend invites you for dinner. And then at the end of the dinner, you say, hey, look, uh, I'm really grateful. Here's 20 bucks. Right? People would be offended by that. 
if you're living with somebody else and you don't want to do the dishes and you say, hey, sweetheart, uh, will you do the dishes? And she or he says, um, you know, no, I don't feel like it. You can, you know, pull out a dollar bill and we'll be like, will this change your mind? <laughs> and then if they say no, you can be like, how about a 20? And most people think that within that kind of relationship, that would illustrate a certain kind of disrespect. Okay, all right. And so Michael Sandel thinks that's really meaningful and important. So you can play this game. You can picture two different worlds. And in the one world, we pay for wedding speeches, we make birthday presents, we grow flowers as gifts, and we make dinner on Valentine's Day. So here's an imaginary possible world. This is not our world. We don't do these things. And compare that to our world, our real world, right? Here we make wedding speeches. We write our own wedding speeches and we give them. We purchase birthday gifts, right? And we buy flowers as gifts and we buy dinner on Valentine's Day. And now my question to you is, which of these two worlds is the moral world and which of these two worlds is the immoral world? And you can, you can just sort of picture a, a twin Michael Sandel. So if you think of those two different worlds as like twin worlds, you can picture these twin Michael Sandels, right? And here on, on our planet, our Michael Sandel, he says, some people buy wedding speeches. Can you believe it? Like, don't they know how disrespectful it is to buy wedding speeches? But you can, it's perfectly consistent to think of like twin Sandel on Twin Earth saying something like, some people write their own wedding speeches. Can you believe it? Think about how disrespectful it is to to write your own wedding speech. Like, what kind of a cheapskate wouldn't hire a professional to capture like the, the things that need to be captured? You should hire a professional, right? And the question from earlier, like which of these two worlds is the moral one and which of these two worlds is the immoral one? Well, obviously the answer is that neither one of these worlds is moral or immoral. These are mere conventions that we use to kind of whatever, so it could be you know, both of these, neither of these things are significant. They just both express different kinds of conventions rather than the truth about ethics. So here's a summary. First, the independently wrong. Um, if it's independently wrong, then markets have nothing to do with the wrongness. So that's true of slavery and it's true of assassinations. Then I walked you through the mere commodity objection in the case of cats and dogs. And they demonstrate that there is no necessary connection between the attitudes that you have and buying and selling things on a market and then finally the wrong signal objection and the truth is that the market can mean different things right we're just talking about conventions rather than some deep truth about ethics okay and on that note thank you very much here's my email address if you want to reach me afterwards and I'm happy to take questions well thank you very much Peter that was uh very interesting, a lot of fun. In fact, the, the chat was very active here with a lot of people uh, highly entertained. <clears throat> Good, I'm glad. But hopefully, you're also thinking. <laughs> uh, well, we'll see, we'll see, we'll see. We'll see. We have a couple questions, and uh, the chat goes on, so I have to scroll up and look for them here. Uh, first one was not a philosophical question, but I guess a practical question. What should a person do if he needs a kidney? Go to Iran? Or if he somehow buys a kidney from someone illegally, is there a hospital that would accept transplanting it? Um, okay, well, you can't go to <laughs> Iran, right? And the reason why is because um, you have to be you have to be a citizen or a resident of Iran to participate in this. So you can't you can't go to Iran, unfortunately. Um, there are black markets in kidneys, and you can get like. Um, the Philippines, for example, is a prime place for um, illegal kidney exchanges. I don't recommend it, but I mean, if your, I mean, if your, if your choice is that or death, then yeah, then maybe you should. Wow. Okay. Pretty heavy. Uh, now, sort of putting your feet to the fire here. Somebody asks. Uh, this, uh, he says, this isn't about whether abortion is right or wrong. As it stands, abortion is legal. But sort of using your premise, why not sell the body parts uh, extracted through abortion rather than destroy them? Oh, uh, that's a great question, actually, because it ties into what was happening here in the U.S. with Planned Parenthood and the 
controversy surrounding that. So let's just assume for the moment that abortion is perfectly permissible, and let's also assume for the moment, because remember that it has to be permissible to do for free on, on our thesis, on the thesis that Jason Brennan and I put forward in order for it to be perfectly permissible to do on a market. But suppose that abortion is perfectly okay, that it's permissible, that it's morally fine, and supposing that it's perfectly permissible to give away those um, the body parts of the baby or the fetus, whatever language you want to use, if it's perfectly okay to gift that for medical reasons or, or otherwise, then it would follow that it would be perfectly okay to sell those, those body parts, right? And I mean, I, I guess I can say more about that too, right? I mean, if there are significant benefits to, um, like medical benefits, then I think it should be permissible to buy and sell those body parts, yes. Way not, way not to flinch there. <laughs> Take the question head on. Uh, somebody asked earlier, and I, I can't find it scrolling up and down, but somebody asked earlier if, okay, you know, maybe the market doesn't cause the problem, but it might create an incentive to accelerate something that's not good. I mean, if you have a market in kidneys, the objection might not be that it's bad to transact in kidneys, but that people will go out and steal kidneys to put them on the market or whatever, that the market could incent other things that are bad. Yeah, so I find that, I find, uh, so part of me thinks that that's a weird objection because the fact that we don't have a market in kidneys is the thing that incentivizes people to steal kidneys, right? So the black market in kidneys, I'm going to take my glasses off because I think there's glare. Um, the black market in kidneys is the thing that incentivizes people to do things like steal kidneys. If we have a perfectly legal market in kidneys in the US and Canada, the thought that like you would wake up in a bathtub and your kidneys missing because there's a market seems crazy to me. Like that's just so counter it, we don't experience that with many other things that are bought and sold on the market, right? Like look, we can buy and sell blood in the US but not in Canada, right? How many people wake up and suddenly like a pint of blood is missing, you know? That never happens, right? And it never happens. If we had a legal market in kidneys, I just don't believe that that would happen. In addition, <laughs> I doubt that there's a hospital that would accept like a cooler full of like, I've found a kidney. Here, I want $10,000 for that kidney. No, <laughs> no, they're not going to they're going to be like, "What are you crazy?" No, you walk into the hospital, right? This is the way that I would imagine the market in kidneys would go, right? You walk into a hospital, you express your desire to sell your kidney. Probably they put you on a list. Probably they have a conversation with you about it. Probably there's a like a long waiting period. Probably there are checks to make sure that you weren't coerced or otherwise pushed into doing this, that you weren't pressured into doing it, right? And then and then you would and then you would go through with the surgery there in that same hospital where they transplant the kidney into someone else who has purchased that kidney, right? I mean, so one response is to say that, like, I just disagree with the, with the intuition that the market would go that way, but a different response which just accepts the premise. So I can just accept, so suppose that that is your worry, um, and suppose that, unlike me, you find that to be uh, an intuitively plausible concern about kidneys. Okay, fine. Then we can change the way that we design or structure the market, right? Um, the book Markets Without Limits is not a libertarian book. It's not a book that says we should have free and unregulated markets. That's like part two, right? So <laughs> I could have written that book, but I didn't write that book. Instead, this is like in principle, there is nothing, there's nothing that you can have exchange or give away for free that you can't exchange on a market, right? So the other response could be like, well, then regulate away your concerns. Whatever your concerns are, I can come up with a regulatory framework that deals with it in principle. So the worry that like people will steal kidneys, fine, make it illegal for hospitals to purchase kidneys in a cooler. In principle, that deals with the problem. Of course, people are going to break the law, right? I, I understand that, right? But this is, <laughs> this is an in principle response to the in principle objection. As for the first part of the question, because it's, it's part of a broader picture, I've focused on kidneys, but it's true that markets might incentivize bad behavior, and then we can respond through either the good application of business ethics, right, or if you're the type of person who doesn't trust entrepreneurs 
um, to do the right thing, then for you, uh, we might need a regulatory response. And as far as I'm concerned, I don't want to make the perfect the enemy of the good. I think a highly regulated market in kidneys would be superior to what we have now, even though the ideal would be um, less regulated markets in kidneys, right? Okay, so those are my, that's my answer. <laughs> Very good. Okay, the next question is, there is a lot of talk about how far is too far on the deep web and in order to have completely free markets, everything must be accepted. And he's, the question is, should there be any restrictions? You know, if you have totally encrypted free markets online, uh, you can do anything there. Kitty porn, human trafficking, other things that are not victimless yeah. crimes. You know, is, is that okay? That's uh, completely apart from the market? or I, I think... I, I think the following, like uh, I object to kitty porn, I object to certain other things that you find on the deep dark web. So it would be wrong to have kitty porn for free, right? It's not as though markets make kitty porn wrong, right? Kitty porn is wrong and we shouldn't have that period, right? Um, so yeah, we should get rid of that. But it's not, it's not the market that's doing the wrongful thing, right? So ag again, I, I guess maybe um, um, maybe the viewer missed the the first part of my talk, where I say that, like, look, the thesis is if you may do it, if it's permissible, if it's morally permissible to do for free, then it's morally permissible to exchange on a market, right? So the first part is figuring out which things are permissible to do for free, and uh, on, on my view, uh, kitty porn is impermissible to do for free and so it's impermissible to have a market in that kind of thing, right? So. Are you sure you're not just looking for uh, job security there? It seems to me that first question will keep philosophers busy for millennia. Which, which first question? Uh, what is permissible? Mm -hmm. but anyway. Oh yeah, yeah, I totally, yes, very, very good, <laughs> yes, I agree. Uh, another question is, in terms not of public policy but of leading the good life for oneself, do you think there are certain spheres of life in which it's better to use gift exchanges or other non-market methods? Oh, that's a great question. Um, so here, uh, I think the answer to that question is going to depend on the kind of relationship that you have with the specific other person. So um, there are economists out there who commodify almost every part of their lives. So I read an article about a, an economist couple that attach money to everything. So if they have, if they're having a fight, so suppose that she says, "Look, um, stop singing." Suppose, suppose I'm singing, or suppose the one guy is singing, and uh, his wife is like, "That's really annoying. Stop singing." He will say something like, "Well, is it five dollars annoying?" <laughs> And, and she will be like, um, yes. And then he'll be like, is it $10 annoying? And he's trying to find the point at which she's indifferent between his singing and some sum of money, right? Um, some people say that, like, markets are a bullshit, uh, a tax on bullshit, right? So, like, people without having the means to, like, commodify or to put a real tangible value on something, I can just exaggerate. So I can say that's really annoying, it's super hyper annoying, right? So in a context like that, it's, I think, perfectly appropriate to make everything into market exchanges. You can also, because I think part of the question there is about the symbolic meaning of these different kinds of exchanges, but you can have your own private conventions. You can infuse money with, with symbolic meaning. I have here, you know, I have my stack of, like, commodification books, right? And here's here's... Here's something that's a little bit frustrating for me. So Michael Sandel doesn't read sociology, or he hasn't yet. Uh, and people have pointed out that like, there are uh, economic sociologists who have actually looked into the social meaning of money. So here's Viviana Zelizer. She wrote a whole book called the social, the social Meaning of Money. And she talks about how in the 1920s, for example, in the US, money carried significant meaning and was considered a perfectly appropriate gift. So if you were to give a gift of money, it was deeply meaningful. It wasn't just like, oh, I was a thoughtless person and I just gave you a 20. That's the meaning that it has in contemporary Western culture. But it doesn't have that meaning uh, across all time 
and in all cultures, across all cultures, right? Here's also a book by Vivian, Zell by Vivian Zelizer called The Purchase of Intimacy, where she talks about markets and sex and markets and intimacy. And so the point is that, like, yes, if you are in a relationship uh, where you set up your own conventions about money, the symbolic meaning of money, you can commodify everything and still have all the things that you might want from gift exchanges. But yeah, if, you're, if your significant other is not an economist or see, has difficulty, like the Greeks and the Colossians did, in being able to switch the symbolic meaning of money from this like indifferent instrument, this like impersonal piece of paper, then yeah, you should just use gift exchanges in those contexts, right? Yeah. It's neither here nor there, but I have to tell you that this example, I can say it, it's happened in real life. One of our previous speakers, Rick Rule, actually paid a kid who was singing at an open sidewalk cafe in a most screeching and annoying voice. He paid the kid $5 to go sing at the next restaurant over to impress a girl, and it worked. Um, <laughs> okay, it was $5 annoying, and, and everybody was hung over. Uh, <clears throat> we have a question here. What are these moral... Restrictions or considerations on market transactions, where does this come from? Is it really government education that inculcates these values or religion or, or where does this come from? Oh boy. Um, whew. You know, that's just such an enormous question. Like the <laughs> Short questions with long answers. The sources of normativity, where does all normativity come from? I'm going to punt at an answer to this, so I'm not really going to give you the the full answer, because that would require literally like a graduate level course from beginning to end to really discuss it. Perhaps you can and, send us a link. <laughs> I mean, sure. I have, I have, um, I have the best book on the subject, which I have somewhere over here. But uh, am I going to find it? It's called The Sources of Normativity by Martha Nussbaum. Anyways, it's somewhere around here, but I, I can't find it. Um, it's called well, the Sources of Normativity, and you can look it up. It's probably the the opening chapter is probably the best treatment of where the like because morality. I agree, it's kind of weird, right? Like when I say, like it's got like you gotta do itness built into it, which is a weird kind of feature of the world, if you will, right? Like um, when I say murder is wrong. Right? It's like this is something that you ought not do. And you might wonder, well, what facts in the universe speak to this kind of thing? Now, I'm not going to get into a, a long and drawn-out discussion here. In the book, Jason Brennan and I accept uh, what you might call common sense morality. Both of us are convinced that there is a truth to morality and that it's uh, an objective truth, um, that it's not mere convention. So part of the question was about like government schools or something, and I agree that you can be taught certain conventions, but there's still a fact underlying. Um, there are facts that underlie uh, the truth about about ethics, and it's not just the kind of thing that you're. It's not ethics is not mere convention, right? Um, so that's I'm merely reporting. I'm not arguing in defense of that view. I'm not defending that view. That would take us so far afield, uh, and I don't have like the resources right now to defend that view. But <laughs> I will say that that is a commitment of mine. <laughs> I believe in the objective truth about ethics. Yeah. Well, very good. Uh, thank you for taking a stand on that. Let me ask you then, real quick, something you can say is, what's been the response to your book? I mean, the kidney is the example, but the principle is a very important one. Obviously, you know, congratulate you for taking it on. Uh, I'm curious both on popular fronts, what do people say? Are, are you being burned in effigy? And on the professional front, are other philosophers responding seriously to this challenge? So the response to the book has been, I mean, frankly, it's been pretty amazing. Um, before the book came out, we were the number one new release, both in business ethics and in the category of ethics, which is a broader category um, on Amazon. Um, so lots of people have purchased the book, and I'm very gratified, and I'm really happy that people are buying the book. In terms of responses, um, so 
you know, academia operates much slower than um, than the real world, I guess. Uh, there are, in the pipeline, I'm aware of at least, um, at least eight to ten uh, responses to our book and to an article that um, Jason and I wrote for the journal called Ethics, which is essentially like a chapter from the book. We pre-published it in a journal called Ethics, which is a, an important journal in the world of philosophy. And so I'm aware of at least eight to ten um, people writing and working on objections to our book and to that article. Um, uh, Ilya Soman from the Washington Post's uh, Volokh Conspiracy blog, he's reviewed the book uh, very positively. So, so far the reviews for the book that I've read have been um, uniformly positive. I'm sort of, I can't wait. Actually, there's a Cato Unbound. If you go to uh, the Cato Institute, has a, a journal called Cato Unbound. This month our book is the subject of that discussion and Benjamin Barber responded to our opening essay and I encourage you to read it. Benjamin Barber, uh, how do I say this politely, <laughs> probably didn't read our opening essay and if he did he completely misunderstood it but it's worth reading because it's, it's I think it's a lot of fun so yeah. Okay. Well, on that note, a very interesting challenge. Uh, we'll have to call it quits because we've run out of time here. But thank you very much for a very interesting and thought-provoking presentation. I want to remind everybody out there to click on the links for tomorrow's sessions tomorrow, separate links all the time, and we'll follow up on this on the discussion group. Peter, thank you so much for your contribution to, to this year's event. Uh, thanks, Lobo. I appreciate it very much. Thank you to everyone for watching this. and. Uh, you know, I wouldn't be a good uh, capitalist if I didn't say, go buy my book. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Have a good night, good day, wherever you are, everybody.